Hello, today we are going to start with the 14th lesson of this course dedicated to the study of the induced electromotive force and Faraday's law. This lesson consists of two different videos. In the first one, we are going to explain the basic concepts related to these topics, and then the second one, in which we will see some practical applications of such concepts. Regarding the induced electromotive force and Faraday's law, we are going to use the following explanation scheme as a guide. First, we will talk about how induced currents are generated, then we will see the relationship with the concept of flux variation, and finally, we will see Faraday's law and a way to apply it. The method we will explain is known as Lenz's law. In previous lessons, we have been seeing the different ways of inducing a current in an electric circuit, and we have seen that we have the possibility of making a change in the magnetic field, as you can see in the animation on the left, in which we have a changing module. The second case is when we have a change in the surface enclosed by the circuit, the circuit is changing area, central image, and there you can see how a current is generated when that circuit changes area. The third one is a change in orientation in the animation on the right. Let's notice by the arrow that is drawn that we do need that change. In the sections where the magnetic field part of the left is constant, or the area is maintained, or the orientation is maintained, we have no induced current in those cases. This means that current is induced as long as change does exist. In addition, you see that according to the nature of the changes, either positive or negative, the current is affected. Interpreting what the value and direction of the induced current is, is what we are going to see throughout today's lesson. First, what do all three of these ways of inducing a current have in common? Well, all three are related to the concept of integral flux through the electric circuit of the magnetic field. Why? Because, in the case on the left, a change in the magnetic field. Clearly, when B changes, the result of the integral changes. If the surface changes, the integration limit changes, S changes, and that is also a different result. And if the orientation changes, the dot product will change, and therefore, the result will also change. I'm talking about three separate cases, but they can occur together, meaning we can have a situation where the field changes, the orientation changes, and the circuit changes all simultaneously. So what we care about is how that magnetic flux changes over time. Well, so that's the common point. That is a variation. I cannot stress this enough, it is important that there is variation. If the magnetic flux is constant, we don't have anything, we do need for that flux to be changing. The faster it changes, the more intense the induced current is going to be, and its direction is going to depend on whether that change has a positive or a negative sign. Well, all of this is what Mr. Faraday discovered, and he formulated it according to his law, which we will now examine. First, let's look at a small yet important relationship. Let's recall the equation that gives us the magnetic force acting on a point charge, F equals Q, V cross B. This allows me to relate, since the international system is consistent, the following units, the unit of force Newton, the unit of charge Coulomb, the unit of velocity meters per second, the unit of magnetic field Tesla. Therefore, it allows me to understand the relationship of the Tesla with other more basic units. The Tesla is Newton second per Coulomb meter. On the other hand, we know that magnetic flux is a surface integral, and consequently, its unit, the Weber, is the same as a Tesla square meter, which, substituting with what we have seen, which is the Tesla, ends up being a joule per coulomb, multiplied by second. And, as for the derivative we are talking about, which is precisely what indicates the rate of change of the magnetic flux, its unit would be the Weber, the unit of flux divided by the second, in other words, by the time. Substituting the expression of the Weber that we have above in the previous line, I get that it is exactly the same as a joule per coulomb. And if we remember the first lessons of the course on the electrostatic field, joule per coulomb is the very well-known volt. So it turns out that the unit of this derivative is the volt. The same as an electromotive force, like a battery. And here is where we have the key to this whole explanation. It turns out that this derivative gives me the induced electromotive force, which is the name given to it. That is, as if we had a battery in there, which is not really there, but it works exactly the same as if that battery of X volts was placed there. Well, so this is what Faraday's law says, that precisely that derivative gives me the induced electromotive force with a minus sign, whose origin is due to the sign criterion. If the sign criterion had adopted the opposite of the one I am going to show you next, that minus would not exist, but one has been adopted arbitrarily, and that means that minus exists indeed. Concretely, the sign criterion is the one you see here, applying the already repeated Maxwell's rule or the right-hand rule that we have already been using during this whole course. Specifically, if the thumb indicates the direction of the magnetic flux, then the palm of the hand tells me how the current is rotating. 
because it tells me the direction of the electromotive force and therefore that of the induced current. How can we interpret this? Let's take a look at two possible scenarios. The one above, we are going to represent a magnetic field varying positively. That is, we have an increasing flux. I said because the magnetic field grows, actually, it would also serve me to increase the area or for it to be better oriented. Well, so, in that particular situation, what happens if the magnetic flux grows? As we are seeing here in this animation. If the flux is increasing, it obviously means that the flux is a function of time that grows. And like all increasing functions, its derivative is positive. Remember that as any other function, when it is increasing, it must have a positive derivative. When it is decreasing, on the other hand, it must have a negative derivative. Therefore, if the derivative of the flux is positive with the minus sign, I get a negative electromotive force, which according to the right-hand criterion means that it does not go like this, but like this instead, that is, as we are representing it now. In the opposite case that the flux is decreasing, that is to say the situation that we are about to see now in the animation, what happens then is that the flux has a negative derivative. Therefore, minus negative becomes positive, the electromotive force is positive, and it does have the direction of the corresponding palm, i.e., the induced current flows in this way. Therefore, we have that the sign of the result, thanks to the minus sign that we have put in Faraday's law, reveals the direction of the current. As for how big or small it is, it depends on the electromotive force, and the faster the change, the bigger it will be. Obviously, if the flux is constant, its derivative is zero, and I have no induced electromotive force, I have no induced current, I always need variation. A way of interpreting it also, of the subject of the signs, is with the so-called Lenz's law, which has nothing less than that very long sentence to explain itself, that the direction of the induced current is such that by its electromagnetic effects, it opposes the variation of flux that produces it. So said, a sentence may scare you, but let's see what it means. Concretely, for example, let's see the upper case. Let's say we have an increasing flux. Well, let's imagine that the loop has its own will. Obviously, it is not true. But let's say that the loop is an opposing element. It never likes anything that happens. It always goes against it. The loop feels that the magnetic flux is growing and says, I oppose, I don't want, I don't want it to grow. I won't be able to stop it, but I'm going to try at least. How can I get in the way? I can get in the way by creating an opposing magnetic field that says, you're going to grow, but I'm going to do what I can. It's not going to do it. Don't think that it cancels that variation, but let's say it makes the attempt. And to create a magnetic field as it is represented, the cut in the loop has to be this way. That is to say, this has to be in the same direction of the electric current. In the second case, if the flux is decreasing, that is to say it is less intense, the loop in that case does not enjoy that either. In a way, it would be opposing to it. That is, it doesn't want for the flux to decrease. How can you prevent such a decrease then? Well, a way to avoid that would be by reinforcing the field in this case. I'm going to try to slow down this whole process. In order to create a magnetic field, that way, the loop has to have a current in the direction that I am indicating with my hand. That is to say, the one you see here. It obviously is the same as I have seen before with Faraday's law. In fact, one could say that Lenz's law is nothing more than a way of writing the sign of Faraday's law, which is evidently much more complete because it also takes into account the values. Some people will feel more comfortable with one or the other, but let's remember that Lenz's law is nothing more than a mnemonic criterion. I am not saying at all that the loop has its own will, or that it is able to prevent the variations. This is all just a simple example that shows us all how this whole thing works. Well, here you have already, let's say, the summary of today's lesson. We have seen Faraday's law and his equation. In the next lessons, we will make applications of all this with practical examples. The sign criteria we must also remember, and Lenz's law, which is a very long statement, but you will have seen that it does not have much complexity if you understand how to apply it. Thank you very much for your attention.